Greetings, everyone. There's a very important fact that is so important that the whole world needs to understand this. And that is that there are a lot of complications after surgery, but fatal pulmonary embolism is one that can be prevented, unlike many others that can't be prevented. Now, how do you go about that? Well, the way you go about that is you have to have enough data to show in the literature that you can prevent them. We have the data, we have 50 years of data. We don't need any more data to prove that we can prevent almost all fatal pulmonary emboli, certainly 99%. Number two is there are a number of risk assessments. Now I've, with, a, with the help of a lot of other people developed a 40 element risk assessment. And as you know, if you ask a person 40 questions, you're gonna find out a lot about them that might help you prevent a fatal event. Now, we also know that those 40 questions have been looked at in 250 publications in 5 million patients around the world. And there's an established algorithm. By, by, by going through and doing the risk assessment and coming up with a score, you can predict which patients need prophylaxis, which patients don't need prophylaxis, and for how long. Now, that's all fine and good. But unless you have a mandatory way to implement that program, then it's not going to save lives. Let's take a look at seatbelts. When seatbelts were first introduced, there was an uproar by the public. We're not going to follow this. The government wants us to do this, and we're not. We're 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 going to do it. We we're not going to wear these. But then after a while, it was found out that people didn't go go flying through the windshields, and it saved lives. So now they bought into that, and and now it's mandated. So that's what we need for this, and it's a long road to go. But I want to tell you that thankfully we've had a, a number of universities around the world that have done a lot of work on this. And the reason why we're looking at this young man who's a brilliant resident from the Boston University surgical program, Spencer Wilson, is because Boston has published 16 articles on this subject, number one. And number two, they've taken the data, developed the algorithm and applied it in a mandatory fashion and oh, by the way, if a doctor felt that the patient wasn't qualified, they could always opt out. But most of the patients went along with that. And as a result of that, their pulmonary embolism rate is very respectable, much less than, it's around a half a percent. And in addition to that, that program, if it were adopted by every other hospital in the US, the results would be very similar and we would have a very low incidence of pulmonary embolism. Now, we're not just talking about the US because today is a very, very special day because we're coming from Dubai and I've sent Spencer to Dubai as my, as my, uh, 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 as my surrogate, if you will, uh, to present these data and to interact with the world community. Five continents, gigantic meeting in Dubai uh, involving, there are 300 participants, but they cover all the continents and people go out all over the world and it's gonna be watched by thousands and thousands of people. So we have the chance to, pre to present this message to all of those people from around the world. And again, I'm indebted, indebted not only to Spencer Wilson, but to his chief, Dr. David McEnany, and also Pam Rosencrantz and the other team at Boston University for their efforts in this. And now without further ado, Spencer, I'd like you to share your screen and let's get on with the show. I'd be happy to. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dr. Caprini. It truly is an honor to be joining you here today from Dubai at the V Winter Forum uh, here for World Expo 2020 uh, in Dubai. As you can see, the Burj Khalifa is over my right shoulder in the background. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, I'm very excited to be talking about our experience at uh, Boston Medical Center with the Caprini Risk Assessment and integrating that into our practice. So let me begin by setting the stage here. Uh, I, as you mentioned, am a uh, general surgery resident at Boston Medical Center. Uh, we are the largest safety net hospital in New England. And what that means is that we provide a significant level of care to low income, uninsured and vulnerable populations. We are a level one trauma center and we're the teaching hospital for the Boston University School of Medicine. 
Uh, I am uh, currently in my second year of research, dedicated academic research time as a general surgery resident. Uh, we have a five-year surgery residency program, uh, which can be up to seven if you do take those research years. We have five categorical residents every year, uh, and we have residents that rotate at the Veterans Affairs Hospital, Boston Children's, and Cape Cod, uh, in addition to BMC. My experience uh, in residency so far has been tremendously rewarding, uh, and uh, I'm very excited to get back into clinical work this coming year. So I'll start by taking us back to 2009, which is before Boston Medical Center implemented the Caprini assessment. Uh, and we participated in the NISQIP National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. And NISQIP is a collaborative that uh, essentially al allows comparison data between participating hospitals about post-operative complications. So if your hospital has high rates of deep venous thrombosis or DVT uh, or pulmonary embolism uh, or PE, uh, NISQIP is a good way to find out. Uh, and so what I'm gonna throw up here to begin is a graph. Uh, and this is a graph that we call a caterpillar hump graph. And it shows the participating hospitals in NISQIP and their rates of post-operative mortality or death after surgery. And what you can see is that the hospitals are ranked uh, in, this, in this list. The, the hospitals with the lowest levels of post-operative mortality are on the far left of the graph. They're doing great. Their numbers are low and they're on the bottom part of the graph. The hospitals on the top right part of the graph have the highest rates of post-operative mortality. So those are the hospitals that have the greatest amount of work to do. And you can see that the arrow is indicating uh, Boston Medical Center, our hospital in 2009. And our mortality rate was 0.84%, which is below expected. Uh, which meant that we were doing uh, fairly well. But I'm going to show another graph. And this graph relates to post-operative VTE, venous thromboembolism. And on this graph, we are at the far right end of the graph. We have the highest relative rate uh, of post-operative VTE relative to expected. So our uh, VTE rate was almost 2% uh, relative to an expected rate of 0.7%. So as you saw in the previous graph, we weren't killing people, but we were hurting them. And there were surgeons at Boston Medical Center that really wanted to make a difference uh, and, and prevent this complication. And so that's what led them to the Caprini score. Back in 2009, there was a lot of emerging evidence around extended prophylaxis for VTE prevention after surgery. And what it showed was that mechanical prophylaxis with things like graduated compression, and pharmacologic or medicinal prophylaxis with things like unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin were effective at preventing this complication. And in particular, it showed that patients that were at really high risk of VTE benefited from extended courses of prophylaxis from seven days to up to 30 days after surgery because a lot of VTEs happen uh, in that time period for the several weeks after surgery. And what we found in our review of the evidence uh, was that just 59% of patients received the uh, recommended evidence-based prophylaxis after surgery. So why did we choose the Caprini score for our system? For one thing, it was comprehensive. Uh, as you already noted, there were 40 different risk factors. Uh, so you're getting a, a really complete account of every patient's individual risk. It also recognized that not all risk factors confer the same degree of hazard. Patients that have cancer have a higher risk of VTE than patients who have uh, just varicose veins. There's also less underestimation of risk. Uh, patients that are high risk are more likely to be identified by the Caprini assessment. And finally, it was very well validated among surgery patients. So we adapted the Caprini score into our electronic medical record. And this is what that looked like in 2010. Uh, this window already looks a little dated <coughs> because it was on, a, on an older version of <coughs> our electronic medical record system. But what you can see is that 
all of the risk factors are organized by the number of points that they'll give. And all you have to do is click on the risk factors to choose the score and it auto calculates. Uh, and not only that, it's gonna tell you what the patient's level of risk is. So we made this mandatory for any patients that was getting admitted to the general or vascular surgery services. If a clinician was admitting the patient and wanted to put in admission orders, our system wouldn't let you put in admission orders until you filled out the Caprini assessment. Uh, and that was really critical to getting this done. It was also standardized across those two services. It was expected that uh, every surgeon and every team was doing this. We made it integrated into the electronic medical record. And not only the score itself, but also the protocol. So when you completed a Caprini assessment for a patient and determined their risk level, this protocol would automatically recommend the correct level of prophylaxis. Uh, and that was linked through these order sets. So as you're putting in admission orders, uh, the clinician that's doing this would, would know exactly what level of prophylaxis to order for the patient. And we also combined this with an early mobilization program called ICOF uh, that was designed to get patients up out of bed and walking after surgery. So as I mentioned, we're breaking patients down into different levels of risk based on their Caprini score, uh, from the lowest level of risk to the highest level of risk. And this protocol linked those risk levels to their recommended levels of prophylaxis. So the clinicians didn't have to do any work to find this out on their own. Uh, it was already recommended. They would know for lowest risk patients, they, they can get by with just early frequent ambulation. Whereas for the highest risk patients, those patients need compression boots and low dose heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And finally, it would also link to the recommended duration of prophylaxis. So for those highest risk patients that I mentioned, they're getting 30 days of post-operative prophylaxis. Uh, for the high risk patients, it would be seven to 10 days. And for the lowest, low and moderate risk patients, they would just need prophylaxis during their hospitalization. So what were the keys to making this so successful? As I mentioned, it was mandatory for every patient that got admitted. You had to do the Caprini assessment or you couldn't put orders in. It was standardized uh, across different services. No matter where you were going and what, patient was, what the patient was getting admitted to, it was expected that surgery patients would get a Caprini assessment filled out. It was automated. The clinicians themselves did not have to do the work to find out what the recommended level of prophylaxis was. The system did that for you. It also calculated the patient's risk score and risk level. And finally, we made it easy to use, easy to check off the risk factors and easy to prescribe the, the right prophylaxis so that clinicians had an easy time of doing the right thing for patients. And what was the effect on practice? So for these patients in the lowest risk group, 100% of patients received the correct recommended prophylaxis level. And that was true for both the low and moderate risk patients. For patients in the high risk group, 89% received the recommended level of prophylaxis. And for patients in the highest risk, 77% received the recommended level of prophylaxis. And it's important to note that we did not make this mandatory that you prescribe the right prophylaxis. It was recommended. Clinicians were allowed to opt out of the recommended prophylaxis, but they needed to provide a reason for doing so. Uh, and so we have, for all of these patients that did not get recommended prophylaxis, we have in our electronic medical record data for the rationale for why they didn't get the, the recommended level of prophylaxis. Uh, and that helps us when patients do get DTE events because we can look back uh, and track why the patient didn't get uh, prophylaxis. And very often there's a good reason why. So let's look at the effect on outcomes at BMC. Our post-operative DVT rate fell 84% from 1.9% uh, to 0.3% after the implementation of the Caprini assessment. This graph that you're looking at shows the raw percentage of post-operative DVT. So back in calendar year 2009, at the start of this graph, uh, our rate was 1.9%. And then after the implementation of the Caprini score in 2011, it dropped like a rock down to 0.3%. And you can see the same thing with the raw data for a pulmonary embolism. The Caprini protocol gets implemented in 2011, and after that, the PE rate plummets 
from 1.1% to 0.5%. So this not only had a transformative effect on practice, it really benefited our patients. This next graph shows overall rates of postoperative venous thromboembolism uh, at our hospital for the last 10 years, from calendar year 2009 to 2019. And you can see not only did these complications drop after the implementation of the Caprini protocol, they stayed down. Uh, they were sustainably decreased. Uh, and so this is showing our risk adjusted ratio of venous thromboembolism compared to other hospitals. And so you can see we pretty much every year since 2009 have been above average uh, or uh, having fewer VTE events than the average hospital. So uh, you already mentioned that we've had several studies published on this uh, by uh, the predecessors uh, of me in the program. Uh, so this is Dr. Michael Cassidy, who's a former uh, quality improvement research fellow uh, with Dr. McEnany and Pam Rosenkrantz published this study in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons that really broke down the benefits of the Caprini protocol for our patients. And since that time, we've had multiple other publications that established uh, the utility of the Caprini protocol for thoracic surgery patients, for uh, thoracic cancer patients, for patients with resectable lung cancer, for esophagectomy patients, for thyroid and para parathyroid surgery patients, patients undergoing breast operations, ENT patients, and most recently after sleeve gastrectomy. And across the board, what these studies showed uh, was that the Caprini protocol was safe for our patients and effective in preventing VTE, uh, uh, including DVT and PE. So this is what the Caprini score looks like at, at BMC today. Uh, we've updated this in our current electronic medical record system. We still have mandatory assessment. We still have automated prophylaxis recommendations. Uh, but now we've got it broken down by problems, medical history, uh, family history, physical exam, uh, so that it's easy to go through the assessment with a patient uh, and select the right risk factors uh, and determine their risk level. So that about wraps us up. The next time, uh, what I would love to talk about is uh, our next steps with the Caprini assessment at BMC, uh, what we've been working on uh, to find uh, the patients that slip through the cracks of the protocol, the patients who are at very high risk of getting a, a VTE, even when they're on the right prophylaxis, and what we can do uh, through our enhanced Caprini protocol to prevent those complications. So with that, I will unshare my screen and uh, turn things back over to you, Dr. Caprini. Like I said, this has been a, a true honor to be here and join you today. Thank you very much, Spencer, for a wonderful presentation. And it's an incredible collection of data, not only to show how you can take an, uh, a protocol and mandate it, but look at what happened over the last 10 years. It's sustained. And it would appear, appear to me that without this type of a program, that you don't get a sustained response. It's like once people figured out that seat belts prevented deaths, that's been sustained and that won't go away. And this is not going to go away. And what I think is really, really impactful is that those uh, individuals, academics, universities, and places around the world that would like to replicate what was done at Boston have the chance to do that. And by doing that can help to lower the incidence of fatal pulmonary embolism worldwide. And I'm also would like to say that I'm indebted to Sergio Gianzini, Oscar Bottini, and Willie Chi, and the International Expo, and the Dubai Expo, and the We've Been uh, International Inter-University Society, which is worldwide and goes to all five continents. How exciting is that? And what a, what a refreshing relief these days that those of us, for example, in America, can reach out and hold hands with all these different countries, and we're all having a good time, and we're all saving lives. What a concept. Yes. So, all right. on that note, there's yeah. something I want to mention. As you know, I just left the welcome reception for the yes. Dubai conference. You'll be delighted to hear that everyone at that conference is wearing the shirt that you're wearing. 
<laughs> with your face on it. <laughs> never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. And it's something that everyone at that conference uh, is trying to live up to and reveres you for. Well, yeah, and, and I would just like to also add, thank you very much, but the reason that this went viral and the reason that Sergio took it viral and all of those other people was not really about me. It was because this is how you save lives. If you interrogate somebody, you're gonna find out enough about them and prevent them from dying. And I, and, and, and I would like to acknowledge Dr. James Schmidt, who's a dentist from, from Maine, who gave me this idea. This was not my idea. Uh, this was his idea. He said, Joe, Joe, it's very simple. If you wanna prevent deaths, you have to interrogate people. So anyway, with that said, it's been a wonderful uh, interaction and I can only tell the audience to make sure that you stay tuned for the next segment from Boston University. Thank you very much. And I hope you all stay safe and Spencer, enjoy the rest of your visit. And uh, we'll see you back stateside when you get home. Thank you, Dr. Kruger.